go. Hey everybody, it is another episode of Theory Forge Friday. We are here today, same time, same place as we've been many weeks. Um, this week we're talking about leveling systems primarily and uh, how they're used in games currently, how they can be used better, and how basically all the different things about them. So that's kind of the topic for today. We've got a great cast, uh, five of us here with uh, Diggs, Phantom X, Neuro, and Sog. So um, we're excited for today's episode and hope you guys are too. So um, I guess I'll just pass it around. Uh, what? I'll, I'll just give everybody the chance to answer what leveling systems are to you. Kind of how do you see them in today's, in today's uh, gaming environment, gaming industry? So, Diggs, go, go for it. Yeah, since I got left in the middle <laughs> from last week. Um, leveling systems are intended to be um, how we're going through the hero's progression. So you start off as the mundane person and you build up, ramp up um, your skills and abilities and uh, items until you become the uber master hero. Um, and I think what we'll be getting into later on today is the problem with MMORPGs is that in those games they're used to uh, delay reaching the end game. Um, so there's a lot of time sinks in there that uh, un feel unnecessary uh, as they try to delay us to get to the finite, get through the finite content. And so we're not stuck for months and months and months and months and months in the end game. Uh, I'm no particular order, Nero. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, there's actually a lot of different aspects to it. Um, games that have a horizontal progression versus a vertical progression have completely different uh, considerations. And then on top of that, there's uh, other aspects to it as to like whether there's a gear grind to it, whether it is completely gear-based leveling like uh, Spiral Knights, for example, does. Or um, you know how how it's approached and how it works for the project. In most games where you have to level from, let's say one to sixty, I, I use the black the uh, the black belt. And I, I just started drinking. I am <laughs> <laughs> the the black belt analogy for level ups, which is basically that you are. Until you are at level 60, you're still like the white belt, the brown belt, whatever the, the color progression of belts is. When you finally hit level 60, that doesn't mean that you're a total badass that you know can take on the world. It means that you've finally gotten to the point where you can start training. Finally, you can start doing all the cool stuff in the game. So it's, it's a weird sort of thing because usually the journey to um, from 1 to max level starts with the best of intentions but somewhere along the line it's just like it becomes a grind either because you want to level up and catch up with your buddies or you want to get through the content really quick or whatever it is uh, valid points <clears throat> leveling systems uh, digs we could talk forever about end game but anyways um, I don't think there should be an end game I, I think traditionally they were a way to kind of speak to where you are within power, your experience within the game. I think initially, you know, in EverQuest, I always go back to EverQuest, there was a max level, but I, quite frankly, I never reached it, and that was fine. There was plenty of stuff to do. Um, I think part of the problem is, is there's a difference now versus then, but leveling systems as they are now, yeah, I think are mostly mostly a way to gate things, but it doesn't need to be that way. Um, hopefully horizontal progression picks up in, in um, more games like we are hoping for next, but um, I don't see them as a bad thing, at least how they used to be. That's where I'll start. All right. I, I'm more with Diggs on that. I see it as a, a part of a, a character's growth. It's a, it's more a way to, to mark how you're progressing and how you're progressing in relation to other people, in theory. Uh, uh, but I agree that we've seen some very overly simplistic implementations that are 
just that missed the point of what growing in levels and growing in power and gaining abilities and uh, expanding it yourself your character like as if a person does so you grow and you learn new things you 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 wax and you wane in different areas like, i'm i'm not as strong as i was when i was 25 and i never will be again i'm okay with that but uh, i'm a little bit wiser you know that the, these ways of that leveling as a way and, and even de-leveling as a way of showing where where you stand and and understanding uh, and, and also taking something away so like you bank something when you play so you're playing and you gain some experience and you gain a level and it takes like it's something that you can bank to take home and say look when I was playing I not only did I enjoy myself in the play of the game, but I accomplished something, and I'm going to come back, and I, I'm going to have something to show for it. Or, you know, I was terrible, and I just kept running and dying at the same bad guy in EverQuest, and I had a corpse run a loop, and now I've, I can't even go where I want to because I suck. <laughs> yeah. I I I feel like there's a kind of a combination of things that has you know brought leveling to where it is, or at least you know where it is in most MMO games. Anyways, I should say to to, to really clarify, you know, a lot of people like all, all the different opinions here and and viewpoints. Um, it I do feel similarly to you, Diggs and Sog, about it being you know a marker. Um, I feel like that's the way games have have tried to use it at first and now more so it's gotten to to become a useful tool for developers in, in linear narratives to you know make sure the people are following along the main storyline or you know directing the story actually it's, it's even used to help that because uh, you really don't go level outside of your level range or whatever so you're kind of staying with this theme um, and so I think you know like this as horizontal progression gets added and more, you know, more line non-linear elements get added to games with sandbox and uh, dynamic, evolving worlds and stuff. I think leveling is like definitely going to have to change to accommodate those and fit well in those. So, um, but I like everyone's points. I think everybody's got a different perspective and different experiences with leveling, and I think it's a mechanic that, you know, is not being used optimally for sure. So I. I actually wanted to say one other thing. The um, the horizontal progression, uh, I, I really like seeing that in a lot of different places. I like it in Planet Side 1. I like it in Planet Side 2. Basically, the idea of a, um, a horizontal progression system is that you initially start, and even works in Landmark, you start with basically you know nothing, so everything is an upgrade as you fill in all of your equipment. Once you've got all of your equipment um, fully customized and optimized, getting other equipment isn't because it's a higher level, a higher tier, so much as that it's a different set of stats that you want to have access to, but it's still a similarly level piece of equipment. So I actually really like uh, horizontal progression systems um, just the same as vertical and you know how they're used and then the other one is kind of looking more at an open skill system something like Ultima Online or Shroud of the Avatar um, hilarious that they're both same examples from the uh, you know same background but it's it's basically the idea that you invest the skill points in the places that you want you you make your class you make your character uh, I know the uh, older Elder Scrolls I haven't played the more recent ones but they they were kind of in that same way that you invest the skills where you want them rather than starting as a very defined specific class and that's all your your gameplay choices are limited to throughout the game. I think we've run into a problem where the content is like balanced all the time so the idea is that content is designed to have the PvE content being the the main focus of a lot of these games it and consuming PVE content is that it's it's tuned finally to work with people with characters that have a specific um, power or amount of power or strength and 
that that's uh, that's their their experience currently. That that's how they rate their experience. How well they've balanced this encounter for a specific level of character strength, instead of where and th this is where it breaks down. It, it's possible to have if if the game is about players interacting with the world and interacting with other players in meaningful ways, you can have a, a character at any level that is contributing to the world. So is the game about the world and interacting within the world and playing within the world and, and uh, how, how you relate with other, other players and how all of that affects the environment? Or really is it just a co-op play against a, a preordained scenario experience. Uh, I always have my let me talk about a Kia moment. Uh, and I'll go into later what my ideal type of leveling system is. I, I like vertical systems, but in a Kia originally you could get to level 100. If you got to level 99 you became a dragon which ended up being kind of like the Jedi problem in Star Wars Galaxies, but for years, like five years, nobody ever got to level 99, and the majority of players were between level 60 and level 85. And anyone between level 60 and level 85 could contribute very well to the world. They didn't, you didn't feel overly gimped. It wasn't like you needed to be at a certain number to be playing the game, because the game was about where you fit in and how you worked together and what you did and and as you got to higher levels there were diminishing returns for upgrades it wasn't like a, a constant vertical progression like wow you leveled to what, 100 now and you've done the first part of your progression which is just basic stat leveling and then there's more vertical progression with gear that goes on to a much higher ceiling after that and it's all about getting, and you get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Like a top geared player is more proportionally, is proportionally stronger than an under geared max level character than a max level character is to a noob. You know, it, it just becomes this huge stretch that doesn't need to be like that. And as you get to higher levels, that you become mature. And then once you're a mature character, you can, you know, some are a little bit stronger than others, and and some aren't. But it's not designed to have this flat cap and and tune against uh, PVE content like that. So really, even to discuss this, there has to, you have to, well, I think, break it down to why do they exist? Why why do you have a leveling system? And part of the things for hearing, you know, end game, okay. There's there's an end part of the game. I would argue there shouldn't be, but there players also be. Need, but players should also need a reason, something to some goal, and the idea of end game as the goal. There's there, in some games that's too far away, and there's little steps in between. It, but that, it's th not, that's where I was. It's but. not because end game is the player goal. It's because there is an end game because there's finite content, and the devs are trying to keep us away from that end game, that finite, co hitting the max content, they want that to take as long as possible because there were subscriptions. And <laughs> they don't want people to stop playing the game when there's subscriptions. They don't want to have people to stop playing the subscriptions. So they added time sinks into those levels so that it would take you time to hit that that place. But no, there's we don't want end game content. You know... I, it's it's kind of funny that you say that because that kind of brings me back to the idea of um, the usefulness of horizontal progression. If everything is kind of as difficult as things in other parts of the world, plus or minus, then instead of going through the progression in one area, getting to max level, and not seeing the rest of the world, and then never seeing the rest of the world because you have no reason to go there, this actually gives you a lot more reason to actually travel the world and see everything. Because you'll still have credible threats and you'll still have things to access that you hadn't seen before, so it it you know it kind of also gives you the feeling that you don't start as like the super uber badass tank. You 
start off as someone who's pretty tough but still defeatable and throughout the entire game you have that same feeling so when you do fight some super powerful boss and you beat it it's like man I'm just some ordinary adventure and I beat that that's awesome but is, is horizontal leveling even the answer because you're it's still a leveling system there's still a time sink. Well, there's still some sort of skill building you have to create right yeah but it doesn't take very it's long it's not to, a level but it's it, it is that it doesn't take very long to get from the start point to fully skilled out with one gear. set of functional skills and equipment. You just mean shallow, gear not, or not horizontal. It, it, yeah. You're not necessarily talking about acquiring more things to do. You're just talking about having a shallow, wide tree, right? It, it's yeah. still, it's still, it's not, I don't know. We talk about horizontal yep. progression. It isn't really horizontal. It's that there are lots of short vertical paths. Right, but but yeah. but it's we say it's well, it's horizontal. So there's a, you're you're gaining a wide variety of skills and abilities versus uh, higher power in terms of damage output, and that should help with. Uh, the devs being able to create content faster for us because they don't have to create mobs that are, you know, immensely powerful and have tons more abilities. They can just have different abilities and we adjust our abilities to 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 deal with those uh, different challenges that are kind of on the same level. And this is See, a, still this assuming that the primary content is defeating a preordained challenge. Right, and I, as long as we have that, does it matter? Like, See, well, th this is my beef with with leveling systems is that I don't like the fact that they're tied specifically to gating content and tied to, you know, a, a, the the storyline. You know, directing the storyline. I feel like that handicaps what leveling can be because ultimately, when you you know, leveling itself as a mechanic is really, like we said earlier on, you know, a, a progress, a depth marker. It's a marker. It's a depth marker progression, and it has value. Every every game, you know, just about every game could have value from a leveling system, from having a way to track and show, you know, depth and progression in a game. Um, now, where you use it depends, you know, whether you're doing, if you're doing a ver more of a vertical system, that just means, like Sog was saying, you know, it's shorter, shorter, longer paths, and horizontal progression is, you know, wider, um, much, much shorter length paths, but I don't see, you know, why you have to pick one or the other. I know, you know, ultimately it, it boils down to how much content can the developers create for the game, but if we start moving into games more like EverQuest Next, more like revival, uh, more of these games that are starting to, you know, key in on games that are going to create their own content. I mean, even Firefall has procedurally generated um, content, so it, it even has that ability where you've got things. And I know Final Fantasy XIV also has some procedural stuff and has more why, and they're starting to have this flexibility to start doing horizontal progression that also contains verticality. And I don't, you know, I think that once levels are stripped away from being a gating mechanic and away from being the primary way that you direct players through your narrative, uh, it opens them up to being a lot more useful to give players rewarding goals to achieve, you know, trackers comparing the, you know, comparing their own power or their own ability or their own how much they've accomplished and achieved in, in one path to another player. And I think that's where the real reward is. You know, that's how you keep players like, oh, I want to get to this, you know, progress this much further in this, you know, branch. There may be 40 or 50 paths, but having leveling is really valuable to keeping players engaged in your game. But if it's gating players from actually playing parts of your game, I don't see how that's a win. You know, I don't... It's, it's just something that's really bugged me, and I know why it is, you know, in today's games that way, but I feel like it, it needs to be moved on from that because it's just more hindering nowadays than it's really helpful. Uh, all it really does is serve to, you know, give developers enough time to create the next content because players consume it so quickly nowadays. Well, if the problem is the same though, that we're when you're benchmarking against static content, 
right? So what you're doing is you're saying this content is tuned for you to play against when you are this strong, and you can't. They can't do it different. That that's not going to be able to change. It, it's about what you're what you're benchmarked against, and that's why I think we look at EverQuest next, and we look at Revival, and even uh, Crowfall, where they understand that the there has to be a dynamic and even human element in the opposition. So even if you're on a PVE EverQuest Next server, the the strength of people who are working against you will matter because they're affecting faction, they're helping factions that you're opposed to, right? So when you talk when when your level and your character growth is it's benchmarked, it's matched and related to how strong other players are, and that's a core to the game, whether it's a PvP game or a, you know, not so much direct fighting, but, you know, we're all affecting the world situation, then you can have this longer uh, growing in strength. So, like, we go back to that uh, night elf and fairy thing that... Uh, you talked about content of EverQuest Next. So, Diggs, we know, is the highest level uh, whatever race and class he is, is playing at the time in the game. He is the strongest. And he is working to help the, the Dark Elves right now. So we know that we need to get three people working for the, the fairies or dryads or whatever they are and able to counteract the amount of effect that this one man can do because the content isn't it's not digs against static boss mob that he's stronger than right now it's digs trying to affect the world with all kinds of pressure against him hey <laughs> So the problem, well, that, the problem that, is the static content and, and what the opposition is, not so the fact that you're level here's my, vertically. Here's my thing when you talk about content. Why did, why in 1999 did EverQuest not feel lacking content compared to WoW? What, what's the difference there? You is, never, is it you never cared the, if you leveled up. I, I never cared it, if I leveled up it, in EverQuest. But is it is it the pace? Is content consume too fast now because simply levels are too short. I think one interesting thing is that th they've really like modern modern games like World of Warcraft or, I mean that's even age now but they put so much into the leveling experience like when you hit a level there's all these new abilities they put all these things. I feel like before you know in EverQuest yeah you had a bunch of new spells available at, at different levels but Sometimes you couldn't even afford them, so it didn't like it didn't. It wasn't such of a big deal. It wasn't like this guaranteed. Oh, I hit the level. All of a sudden, I get this major power increase. It was so much more incremental that you didn't feel this urge to. Oh, I've got to you know get the next level. Or I've got to be this thing. You just kind of went about your business and continued leveling, which kind of brings me to this. I want. I wanted to ask everybody. You know, we've we've kind of like been slightly diverging we're still on topic but um, what I'm seeing everybody talk about is power creep a little bit and this is something that really you know in most MMOs has gone hand in hand with leveling like you level up you get power increase like that and it, it's called power creep and it's just the fact that as you play more you get stronger um, which is just a style of gaming like not games don't have to have a power creep it's just what MMOs do because it's such a long term progression, you know, permanent world type game that they want you to feel like you've gained, you know, something. And I feel like, you know, not you don't necessarily have to have power creep, and that's where this horizontal progression neurotoxin was bringing up. You know, horizontal progression kind of is a lessening of that power creep. It, it's more about customization than power gains. It's, it's customization gains, uh, preference gains. So I wanted to ask everybody, you know, if you were, if you had to choose between power increase and option increase, you know, versatility, um, what would your preference be and why? I think uh, I'm going to jump in so we can kind of uh, redefine what power creep might be because uh, RPGs 
you have to have character progression. Um, and what we're talking about is whether the, the power creep is going to be an increase in damage output or an increase in the number of, abili of abilities that you have. So in some ways, it's the difference between Batman and his gadgets, which is horizontal progression, and Superman and his godlike, you know, damage output. Um, and so I think you know, what we're striving for in some ways is to be the superhero and, you know, have been, you know, Batman or Clark Kent and then move towards Batman or Superman. Bruce Wayne or Clark Kent and move towards Batman or Superman. And it doesn't really matter going to be Batman or Superman. We can either have a bunch of gadgets that we can use no matter what situation we're in or we can have the ultimate power. But the Superman... The Superman part, always going for that, is what's causing us to, you know, have to wait for this, these massive increases in um, in different areas and more powerful, uh, more powerful monsters to fight. Um, it's easier for the devs to create content quicker and more reasonable content that we can consume without an end game if we have more horizontal progression. Um, and so, yeah, either way, it's kind of power creep. It's either Batman gaining more gadgets or Superman becoming more powerful. I, I think there has to be. The, you, can't, uh, you can't play an MMORPG and not feel like you're gaining in strength. Uh, unless, uh, or... Or feel or increasing your influence or or growing something, and because you know I don't care if I, I really like my sword and board. I don't care that I have the possibility to grow my character by learning how to use a fireball. You know that's not what I that's not what I want to do. I want to be I want to find a way to make myself a standout, awesome contributing sword and board warrior you know i i don't care how many i don't care if i can learn to use a flail and a rapier no, and all of these what other you things. want I've is got my, i've got my long sword or yeah what you want is shield bash you want lunge you want things that combo and chain together that's that's what you want at that point but it, but there's only so much that that's still just short i want to continue growing and getting stronger and better I've got to let everybody else weigh in, but the other problem that I've been having, too, is that um, we've kind of been dodging, is that we've got to get away from the focus on combat. Um, there's got to be other stuff in these games to do besides just combat, and that's been one of the problems that we've been having, is that there's been too much of a focus on just having combat and all of your abilities being tied into to You're already combat. starting to answer my next question, Diggs, that I was going to have. So I'll let everybody weigh in on the uh, the power creep versus versatility type thing, and then I'll ask the next question. Yeah, and you know, that's actually a funny thing, because in many games, crafting and harvesting are actually tied into the, uh, the leveling. So you can't even collect those highest level herbs unless you're tough enough to survive in that region. Now, the, the thing for me is power creep is a gating mechanic with an aspect of positive reinforcement. And what I mean by that is it's definitely there to keep you from getting into a place that you haven't earned your, your right to get into through uh, character power and you know equipment quality. So it, But it's there with an aspect of positive reinforcement. That thing that just pounded your face when you got close to it five levels ago, now you can actually stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with it. You know that's that's something that kind of lets the character, you know, the player know that their character's progressing, that they're actually making progress, that they're actually you know expanding their their area of influence. Now the the other thing is, uh, WoW actually had this really funny mechanic that there is the offense skill and the defense skill, and you get five more points of those every level. If you were maybe about plus or minus fifty offense and defense skill of uh, someone else you were fighting, player or enemy it's just a one-sided match because you're not able to make contact, you'll do less damage. Um, or likewise, if you're the one with the higher stats, you're pretty much you know, shrugging off everything that they're throwing at you and pounding them with full damage plus. So it, it was something that really reinforced, hey, you're way tougher than this, 
not only do you have better gear and better skills, but you have this magical ability to just, you know, dodge attacks that are coming at you, even if you're not a dodgy class. But we're still talking about this idea that there are just static mobs in the world and that that's and that fighting them is what the game is about. And I don't think that's what any of us really want out of the game anyway. I, that that this is where I'm di- that I, where I'm losing uh, the argument. Like I, or losing track of the argument. Like we're talking about we're complaining about a system because it doesn't work in a system that we don't like anyway. Now we don't want static. Mobs. We don't want there to be this uh, one area that has level one spiders that you that when you're big and powerful you can stomp on eight of them at once uh, but when you were a noob you had to pull one off and hope that you survived that one battle you know that's not what we're looking for we want content where you know depending on what's happening in the world those spiders could potentially be very strong too and that the content is reacting to and changing based on the strength and power of the characters in the world and that different things are happening with the understanding of how powerful people are. We're, we can continue to grow in strength and power, but then there should be things coming in to challenge that power. Whether there are other players, uh, uh, opposing player factions in a PvP game, or, or whether it is this idea of dynamic content. I, I've talked many times the idea of, well, if I can kill something and level up, what if this orc kills a player. You know, is it like, um, and Shadows of Mordor played around with this idea too, that, you know, they can level up and they can grow and they can be, they can start leading their own troops and, you know, get their own characteristics and, you know, and even know you as that guy who keeps coming and keep, he keeps crushing you. So when you show up, like, oh, you're back for more. <laughs> you know, you remember what happened last time. That growing in strength and growing in power, as long as it's not excessive, it shouldn't be. You shouldn't be gaining ten percent of your previous power every time you level up. But if you're still growing and getting stronger and getting stronger, and the world is changing around you and evolving, that's awesome. I want that. I I want things. I want that feeling. I want to feel like. One day, because I'm at the top of the, I'm at the on top of the bell curve of where other players are, that because of that, I'm a little bit ahead of the content and I'm stronger. But if I, you know, slack off and I'm not playing as much, I fall back to the other side. And because the whole game dynamic is changing, then all of a sudden I'm a little bit weaker. I am not as strong as the average player, and the way that the content works, therefore. You know, I need I need help if I'm out in the world. Am I? <laughs> Maybe and, I think yeah. this too much. I, there was something, you know, not that we all think this way about horizontal progression, that it's going to be the big thing to solve everything, but when you're talking about power creep, because that does have to, there has to be some motivation to keep playing. Somehow you're improving. I, I don't see, I don't see horizontal as, progression as necessarily being the savior that some people might think it is for vertical progression. And the reason I sometimes feel that way is, you know, vertical vertical progression, basically they're saying you've killed enough of, you know, enough skeletons to earn some um, artificial point value of experience that you've now gained enough of those numbers, you've crossed the line and now you get access to new spells. So that's sort of the vertical progression, right? Horizontal progression. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, How gain else access you? to more powerful damage output spells. Because horizontal is gaining more spells too, but that's... that's it. You're, you're kind of getting to my point, Diggs. Horizontal progression is the same thing. You're just simply removing that generic number. You, now you're saying you've done something enough times that you get access to this, right? Yeah. So you're... It's, you're it's the same. It's, it has it's the same pitfalls. The same. No, has, but I, I think the horizontal progression adds flavor, and also not just into the flavor to what you're getting, but it adds flavor into how you're earning that. You know, if you're in a vertical progression type thing, 
you're going to keep going and you're going to get stronger spells that are mostly similar, you know, or you're doing a lot of the same things on this recurring path to keep pushing up this power, you know, this barrier further out. So. Let, let right, so here's, the, here's let, me, let me clarify my thought. Go so what I, what I mean by that is, in my mind, in a vertical progression, you've, you've swung your sword enough times that you've gained enough experience points that you can now thrust it. In my mind, horizontal progression, you have swung your sword enough times that you have learned how to thrust it, simply removing the experience value. No. What happens with vertical progression is that moment where, you know, in EQ you had the cobalt pups and, you know, you're hanging out at the, at, the, uh, at the hinge and doing your own thing and they come around and you're first level so they kill you. By the time you're fifth level you come around and you cast your fireball and they're instantly crushed. That's vertical progression, where, where you go back in your 10th level, and anything that's first level is instantly killed. Um, no. What we want to avoid, and what we want to get to with horizontal progression, is where it still might be a challenge to defeat those kobolds, but you're going to have a lot of different options about how you go about doing it. I'm that's just talking about how you obtain I, the skills. To, to, to answer Scott's point, too, I think that uh, I, see, I see what you're saying, and I think that it's still a benefit, even though it's like in, in your, the way you've explained it, it's just removing that artificial point value, the experience and how you're doing things. It's still beneficial because that point value increase that you have to build up over time is a barrier to entry for people that want to group together that don't have the same amount of time in a game. Whereas a horizontal progression game, you can take on the same content, whether it's somebody that just started playing a couple of days ago and somebody that's been playing for months. So it's a huge advantage there. Doesn't mean you'll succeed. Yeah, but but that's, I want that's that's a, it's a la it's it's a huge lack of advantage. What you're saying is a positive yeah. thing. Well, and the other thing I wanted to do here it was kind of the next thing that the dig started to answer earlier is I kind of want to flip this all all of our logic that we've said so far on its head by the fact that is it is it necessary for us to have power gains of any kind, whether it's horizontal or vertical, because I think there is definitely an argument out there that episodic content has become very attractive, and people might enjoy being relatively similar in power, but being able to progress through a changing story, an evolving world, different people coming in and out, without a real massive change in their broadened set of abilities or a vertical power increase. So do you even think that having this increase is necessary for a game, wh whichever one it is, or can there be games that exist without any type of, you know, vertical progression because the story itself is progressing. Including, are, including well, gear, well, but, including anything. So you just but, never get stronger? Is that well, you're that's asking? A, you just well, never get stronger, but what? you just experience a changing story and evolving world without ever actually gaining substantial power increases, horizontally or vertically. I could see that being done single player, but not really as an MMO. Well, the problem is that gets back to what type of game, what genre of game are you playing? If it's an RPG, then no. You have to have character progression, and you have to have a hero's journey. If you're just playing around in a persistent world, and the reason you want to be there is just because you like hanging out in persistent worlds, like some kind of fantasy area of second life then no you might not need that you can just cosplay and you know not have any powers you know but but fantasy rpgs sci-fi rpgs are about that hero's progression you have to have progression see i i kind of disagree because i feel like in a role playing game like you can still pick a specific power set or, or pick you know build your own custom class with a certain limited set that doesn't necessarily gain any strength over time and you just play your role in a society and that's a role playing game just as much I think as I mean it's not the typical MMO RPG we've experienced for that, years that, but I that's think a life that's a life simulator not not a role yeah. playing game and and even but, then you know as a as a dancer as an actor you know we're striving to get better, and so how how do you put that into the, the game? That that's what we're striving to do in an RPG is not just stay status quo, but become better. There's just other things that we can become better at besides just combat. 
I'm just I I'm a big fan of a, the attempt to design a system where the the expectation is that players are within a band and on a curve level wise as they're playing. So you give people the option of being stronger, but you make the the iterative steps smaller and even um, even static number increases. So like if you gain six damage points every time you level when you level from 100 to 101 that six damage points is a very tiny percentage of growth so you end up with diminishing returns you get that early like i'm getting stronger you know i'm growing in the world now i'm ready to take things on and then it becomes you know whether you're level 80 or level 90 is not really that important you're you're a mature character and this i and i i think there has to be a way where somehow you regress also in order to make that happen uh, not necessarily deleveling death loops but even just like you know a little bit of skill decay so uh, if in a horizontal environment say you're using your sword and board all the time uh, you're getting stronger and better with that, but you're not using magic, so you're kind of, like, waning. Uh, I think Camelot Unchained has a couple systems in mind like that. But the idea is that it shouldn't be this race to the cap, and then you're playing a different game. That's what we don't want. But But growing in strength, especially early on, I think is important. It gives that hook. It gives that feeling. I like the feeling of being able to throw my fireball and kill all of those cobalt pups who it won that, that I was struggling with. But then at some point, when you're measuring against another player or against, or against the content, it doesn't mean so much. Like, I, I, I think yeah. diminishing returns are a nice... Diminishing returns and very high unreachable or non-existent caps are a good way to go. Yeah, I mean, that's the ideal character journey there that you want, really, you know? Like, you start out, you're this somebody who's not a hero yet, you know, you start discovering powers and abilities, and you get these quick gains that make you realize you can be more in the world, and then, you know, in a, in a game that's meant to be a persistent, ongoing experience, you shouldn't have that power increase probably should not continue because if it does you know we, we're experiencing the downsides of that today because it has done that and we've realized that it creates a type of gameplay that actually doesn't lend itself well to a permanent you know or a persistent type world so I feel like you know any any good game that's gonna kinda solve this issue is gonna have to you know come along with an answer to giving you some early rewarding games to give you that hero's progression, but then get to a point where you're participating in a larger community, a larger world, a larger narrative and storyline that, you know, there's not such a wide degree of variance between what you can do and what another person can do, because you all want to be able to play together, you all want to be able to accomplish cool things and move the story forward and, you know, have this push and pull of conflict between different nations and, and things like that, so, and really, the, the way that Get, you know, leveling content exists now doesn't offer that. It's it just continues to grow. You know, they just replicate the one to ten, to ten to twenty, twenty to thirty. They replicate it, and it just you know it creates a huge variance in gameplay. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I like about what Dave would say about uh, EverQuest Next, and I hope would be the case in EverQuest Next, we should never be able to solo a dragon. Um, you know. We can become masters, but it's you know we're we're not expecting Gandalf to solo a dragon, um, and we're not expecting everybody to reach Gandalf's you know status in any case. Um, one of the things that I like uh, that's kind of a different take, I think, than where Sog was going that I like about uh, Revival is we're not necessarily going to be losing um, prowess, but we will be gaining disadvantages. You know, using magic too much might drive us mad, and instead of 
trying to focus on gaining more magic. We might be focused on trying to, you know, Cure get rid herpes. of the transfigurations that we, you know, that we gathered so we look more human instead of more demonic. Um, so it'll take us in different paths besides just that, that vertical progression and, and always getting better. Some of the things that allow us to get better is also going to make us worse. Um, but again, with Revival 2, there's other things for us to jump into, and I hope this is the case for EverQuest Next as well, like politics, um, other stuff for us to focus on besides just gaining combat power. Yeah, politics, the landlordism is another aspect, but I think the big thing is that journal will constantly be growing with all the new interactions that you have. And that was one of the things that's interesting is even, you know, years, like five, ten years down the road when your character is finally out of spirit and they die their final death, they pass that journal down to the next character. So you still keep your your possessions and you still keep your journal. Your new character is basically just going to be a, a social reset. They don't know any of these people themselves. Um, Murma, you're absolutely right. Vanguard had a really cool diplomacy system. Um, it was basically a card game though it had progression to it. It wasn't actually a um, horizontal progression. There were definitely cards that were way better than other cards. And your deck by the end is going to have like almost none of the same cards you had in your deck at the very beginning of the game, should you choose to play that route. But it definitely had you know a progression, and it kind of helped you get around the world, though it was just like a mount that, you know, if you ever get off your mountain bad territory, you're just going to get one-shotted if you just play a diplomacy character. So it still has a very uh, combat-centric element in is that you can't really get around safely without the combat skill, even if you've leveled up your diplomacy to max rank. But Before we get too far from it, I think Diggs really, the way you said it really kind of put the nail in the head from my perspective. Um, when you said, you know, something that Revival is doing to combat this idea of just always wanting to vertically progress by when you gain these strengths, you're gaining, you know, some negative things along with it that are maybe going to cause you to take different paths or whatever. I think that, you know, when, when we talked earlier about having the hero's journey, as a writer myself, you know, when you're creating a character, more often than not, generally, the, the strength of your character's personality or his abilities or anything is also one of your leading points that you use as his major flaw, too. It's, it's, and it's kind of the way it is with humanity. A lot of our biggest strengths and talents can also be our biggest weaknesses, you know, cause us arrogance. So I feel like, you know, that's really an answer that needs, or that, that's, a, that's an answer to me. That's something that could be used to provide the type of experience we want still with the hero's journey and having this role-playing thing, but also, you know, fighting this need to always progress vertically, you're still going to want to progress, but, you know, there's going to be some more difference to it that's actually going to feel like that story that we all want to experience. You know, you read the book, you follow the hero, and and I think that's, the way, I don't know, the way you said it kind of just set that off in me is, you know, that is a really good answer to doing that, and um, there, I think more games should explore something like that, you know, having your strengths be your weaknesses. I know Crowfall is, they have their character selection thing, kind of the shadow bane thing where, you know, you select strengths and you get, you know, weaknesses or you you select weaknesses starting out and you get additional points for strengths that you can add to your character. So I think those are all things that can help combat this, well, you know, leveling issue. If we want an MMORPG, the point of the game needs to be having a role within the world and having your own journey and finding your own place in it and doing what you want. I, I keep going back in my head to that Ralph Coster Star Wars Galaxies article talking about when people like cracked the Jedi code and they st people were doing what they wanted in the game. People were raising animals if they wanted to be animal raisers. Uh, people, were, people had their roles and they were playing as part of this society in the game. But then all of a sudden when this idea of, well, there's a direct path to get to supreme power, people stopped doing that. They, they, stopped doing, they stopped performing their roles in the game, and they just went through the motions and stopped having, and then they weren't having fun. And people either stopped playing, 
or they went through motions playing the game in a way that they were not enjoying just to get to get this shiny at the end. It, but that's not what it should be about. There shouldn't be this, I need to get to max level. The, the point of the game is not leveling. The point of the game is, I want to be this person in this world who does these things, and I want to get better at that. But and I want to be very good I, at it. It's not about it's not about the number. It's not about the yeah. the top. It's about it. It has to be the game has to be designed about performing a function. I think you I think you kind of labeled the key difference there, Sog, because a lot of what you were saying was kind of things I was saying about having this you know life simulator, this world simulator type thing where there is no vertical progression. But that last thing you said, you know, with you know, the ability to improve. I think that's kind of what defines the difference between, you know, a life simulator and alternate reality to being an actual epic, you know, RPG game, whether it's fantasy, sci-fi, that ability to have the hero's journey along with a, a secondary life. And it's tough to marry those two ideas, you know, they're two very different games from having this single player hero's journey or having this social online alternate life like they're they're two different things and combining them is really challenging so i think that's you know that's that's where an issue where leveling has gone awry um in trying to solve that and i'm not even sure a lot of developers maybe even are cognizant of these two things they're fusing together and the challenges both i think you know these games have been being made for so long that there's just kind of a model out there and people are just changing that model or doing things they like with that model that they're not actually rethinking about what the game is that they're making and you know finding right ways to add the systems together or to come up with the right environment that's going to allow people to have both of those experiences in one place you know one of the things that we've been focused on this whole time is uh, well what we've been focused on is what we get when we level and we haven't been focused on what ex gaining experience points is like um, and what I mean by that is that the traditional model that we've been using is that we gain our level, we go out, we fight a bunch of mobs and that gives us more experience points but we're really still kind of fighting at the same level of challenge like the, the challenge of defeating the mob is always about the same difficulty level. It's just by comparison to what, you know, if I go back and fight a level one, I'm much more powerful than that. But I'm not going to gain very much experience. Um, and so where we're at is that we have to keep doing the same kind of stuff over and over again to get this same amount of uh, XP that feels like we're we're progressing at this uh, at a reasonable pace um, and what I think Revival is doing with standing points is there's just by playing the game you're gonna get points that you can use to customize your character that's again just not necessarily all focused on combat um, so if we can get points just by participating in politics or just by, you know, vote, choosing to vote. Um, if we're getting points that we can use to customize our characters in other ways than just combat, I think that might help as well. It's not, yeah. about, it's not about reaching level cap. Because what happens when I'm playing, I'm not really trying to reach level cap. There are certain skills that I want, certain abilities that I want, and those are, that's the next carrot on the stick. Okay, if I do this, 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 then I'll be able to get Spirit of the Wolf. Um, and once I get Spirit of the Wolf, then I feel like I'm a real druid, but then I need to get blah, 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 form or whatever. Um, and that's always that next carrot. But See, another issue is another issue with the problem, too, is what MMOs are of being such a wide... Uh, experience for people that, you know, there's PvP in it, there's PvE, there's role-playing, there's all these different things, especially once you move from combat to a much wider, or well, even more things to do, now you have to struggle with what, 
you know, each person is going to have a different thing they want for the game. So how do you design the progression to reward people, you know, to make people feel rewarded for what they're doing and progressing towards what they want to do? Because it's definitely, you know, there are some people who play the MMOs of today that they just go to level cap because they just want to participate in what the end game content is, whether it's raiding or whether it's having all the top gear. You know, they may not necessarily care about what abilities they have or if they're a real druid. So I think that's a challenge too. Once you know, especially the more you add, you're going to have to start thinking about design in, you know, how your players are going to feel rewarded no matter what way they want to play the game. Which I think too, this, you know, kind of lends itself towards one of the issues with Landmark right now. People don't really. There's a lot of ways to play the game. People can do a lot of different things to enjoy the game, and it is it is fun to do. But how do you make players feel rewarded in the long run for what they're doing in the game? You know, and how do you tie that into making it a, you know, a bigger experience where you're participating with other players and what you're doing matters to them and you have a place in the world? Because that's kind of the issue with Landmark right now. You have a lot of ways to play the game. They're starting to add ways that you can get rewarded for playing the game you want to, but there's still no connection to people having a role in the world that's meaningful. Okay, now that's something I actually wanted to bring up. Um, it's kind of a really weird thing, but if you think about it, let's, let's roll back in the way back machine, back when Diggs was in high school or whenever D&D &D came out. You know, when, that's, that's kind of where the origin of the RPG came from, is the pen and paper RPG, not the digital version. And in the pen and paper RPG, there's no way to play the game without a DM. I guess it's really hard. You could have a, uh, a set of die rolls or whatever determining what the DM would do. But, you know, you do something smart, you do something that's off the books and it works, you get a rewarded experience for it. So a lot of them were not just about, like, kill things, get loot. Sometimes they'd give you more experience if you don't kill the thing and you just steal the thing that you came in to get. Uh, and likewise, they might just tell you, no, I'm the DM and I'm putting my foot down. You took the thing you needed. You're not going back in to murder them. You're not chaotic evil. So, you know, there was a lot of kind of push and pull with that. But then the other thing is it's a directed experience. It might be the illusion of choice, the illusion of an open world, but it's only content that the, D the DM is willing to let the player get into. There might be an entire world that you're playing in and exist in, yeah, but your entire adventure's going on in this small, like, 20 by 20 kilometer island, and that's that's what this campaign is. So, it's really hard to extrapolate that to even a single player adventure like Baldur's Gate and that sort of stuff, where I guess you play that multiplayer, and then even further extrapolating that to an MMO, something that is up 24-7, and that it isn't just something where one person completes the quest and it's done in the world forever. It's that everybody gets to go complete the quest so they can get their own piece of the pie and get their own reward. So it's really just a weird extrapolation how you level up, how you progress. Going from those roots, those origins in D&D &D and GURPS and other games like that, and even earlier sorts of stuff, uh, uh, some of the stuff like Games Workshop was working on, um, to an online virtual uh, simulated version of the same thing. It's got a graphic user interface that's sweet, but you don't have a DM 24-7. Revival with the gold servers is going to at least have some inklings of that because those are going to have the storytellers. But that's not nearly the same as every single player or group having their own DM running the adventure in the world, affecting change in the world. So it's, you know, the kind of looking at where we went from there to you know where we're at now with the uh, the MMO it's just so distinctly different and you know it it kind of in the question of where did leveling come from and why did leveling appear leveling's always been there that was one of the major mechanics that's always been around but it wasn't always combat there were so many different things you could do that would guarantee you know that would get you some amount of experience you could play a D&D &D campaign where you're uh, a level one druid, but all you're doing is druid politics the entire time and errand quests and stuff. So, that's that's what I got to say about that. Before we get to questions, the take home that I'm getting from everyone on the leveling system is that it's really a component of a lot more other things, which is obvious, right? We've talked about content, we've talked about AI, so it's not just level systems improving; it's the entire experience improving. 
Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's fair to say. I, I mean, and part of it is too that as games are evolving, and you know, the next developer is trying to make a, the next better game, you know, they are having to improve the whole experience, and leveling is part of that. Which, you know, to date, I would say leveling and AI have been not iterated upon hardly at all. Then it just started is now. I mean, we're seeing games like Firefall, Final Fantasy fourteen. Uh, EverQuest Next, Landmark, they're experimenting with different types of progression, uh, and that's finally starting to happen. But until AI rolls around, you know, that's still going to be something that's kind of like the missing key ingredient, because so much of the game revolves around AI. It doesn't matter if it's combat or not, not combat. You have to have AI, because people aren't always there. I mean, there are games that are trying to do, what is it, uh, Shroud of the Avatar and Pantheon Rise of the Fallen are, are trying to gear it to making all the players' content be, be the content for each other, but, you know, how well are they doing? How well will they do in the long run? It, you know, you just can't control other players. The developers can't really control other players to make sure they provide a good experience for the other players. So, AI need, really has to improve. We need emergent AI, and those are going to be the key factors of both EverQuest Next and Revival. Yeah. I don't know. Well, we have some I, I questions here. Some, we can start asking something. some questions, and also if you guys uh, have more questions after all this heavy discussion. This has been a pretty heavy discussion. I don't think we've had a discussion quite this intense in, in quite a while. So um, if you guys have more questions you've thought of, be sure to submit them. But we'll start going through the list here, and I have one by Murma that asked, can you lose the low-frequency feedback loop? Which <laughs> I'm... Audio. He was complaining about uh, Phantom X microphone, I think. Oh, <laughs> nice. Uh, good, que good question, Murma. Did we do it? I'm not sure. I, guess I think so. That. <laughs> so um, the next question then that we have is Baby Cannon asked, the most profitable models are n now are MOBA and mobile social. Sandboxes have attracted the hard cores, but... The, but not the general market. How do you think the games built around long-term gratification of growth, vertical or horizontal, can compete with the short-term gratification of MOBAs, social games, which are basically instance-based? Well, I uh, actually brought up in chat that Crowfall is trying to answer that themselves with the campaign system. It's kind of like um, uh, Dota-style MOBA a little bit in as much as that you maybe have a little bit of perks and bonuses you can select before you go into a match. But when you join a campaign, you're dedicated to that campaign. You can't leave. You're, you're pretty much stuck in there until it's over. Fortunately, there's definitely a clear-cut endgame conditions. One faction owns seven control points, or the population of one group is bigger than another. Uh, and they can definitely mess with the rule sets on that and have some really gnarly stuff. But it's that at the end of the campaign, that world goes away. You lose some of the you know progression and stuff. You keep some of the resources from that battle, and you can apply them in different places. I think your Eternal Kingdom is one place, and I think uh, you know general upgrades and stuff for your character so you're a little better when you come in the next battle um, is a part of it. But it's definitely something where it's got more of a um, Dota-style MOBA focus in mind without trying in any way to actually be League of Legends or Dota or any of those kind of games, but instead use the, uh, the best of what we know about MMOs and um, you know, multiplayer arenas to make the best experience possible that constantly refreshes as a new thing every time. I, I heard Dust tell uh, someone brought it up, maybe one of you guys brought it up too. Um, it's also trying to do the same sort of thing. When you join a server, it's only up for a certain amount of time. As long as it's been up, there's actually a bottom end for where you come in with your progression. So you'll already start at level 8 if it's been a long battle. And likewise, there's a top end cap. So if you've been just whooping people's asses all up and down the map, there's still only a certain point at which you're able to uh, progress with the passive experience gain and active experience gain before you're pretty much just waiting for more, you know, more time to elapse to be able to get more powerful. And you're not really waiting that long. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff to be doing, and uh, I don't really think most players get to just hang out and do nothing for too long because you're going to get ganked. 
but <laughs> it is yeah. it is also very very Dota style MOBA focused in that you can you know the the pacing of the game and stuff and the fact that there are kind of not clear cut lanes and towers and stuff but there's definitely choke points and a lot of the action will happen at those and the resource spots so you know there's definitely companies games trying to go away from the traditional model and I like for for something that's specifically combat centric Dostal and Crowfall are definitely going the right direction but that's specifically if that's the the style that you're going for yeah I, I agree I, I feel that like that those two games for combat are moving in the right direction for what's good for that type of gameplay uh, and at the same time I feel like revival and you know what we still know of EverQuest next that wants to be are the right direction for an RPG of you know fewer barriers to entry for grouping with people and having the epic heroes journey with each other that you want to have um, and having a world that actually evolves and doesn't feel static because I think you know that's a big part of a role-playing experience and creating the immersion you know it's not all that immersive if you know all the same people are doing the same quest and the NPCs never change or you know the the world never changes because of what you're doing that doesn't lend itself well to having a heroic journey so but yeah I, I definitely I definitely think that um, back to the original question that Baby Cannon said, you know, having uh, so many people getting attracted to sandbox environments now um, and being used to these shorter sessions and these, you know, instance things, uh, there's definitely got to be some push and pull as far as whether it's a combat related game or an RPG focused game uh, for MMOs that, you know, they, they're going to need to start catering a little bit to the audiences that, you know, all right, we've just grown accustomed to changing to the this type of uh, you know, shorter pre, pl, uh, short, shorter session length and things like this. And I think sandbox too. Giving I think player agency is something that's coming back. You know, Mass Effect really you know had this illusionary player agency, but I think it really opened people's eyes up. That whole series did to to this enjoyable experience of having an episodic type content where you're making choices that are impactful. And I think people want that not just in single player games. They want to have that in multiplayer games to some extent. You know, but it, it is difficult to balance how much you're going to allow players to affect each other's experience. So that's that's a real challenge I see with, you know, uh the different MMORPGs coming up. Between EverQuest Next, Revival is going to allow a lot more, you know, pushing around of each other. Uh, than I feel like EverQuest Next is. I feel like they're both moving up, but one is definitely going to be more catered towards the you know hostile players affecting each other's experience, whereas EverQuest Next will probably be a lot more you know fenced in. You're going to have some player agency, but you're going to be able to experience the game the way you want without people intruding on it. So, but yeah, that, so uh, did we have any other questions pop up? Let me check really yeah, quick. Yeah, we had a couple, but we need to have a very quick intermission and come right back because All right. <laughs> yeah. my computer sorry about that folks <laughs> we'll be back